If you're listening to this podcast on YouTube, for a better experience, switch to the video version. The link is in the top right corner of the video and in the episode description. Hello and welcome, I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, we're going to do an up-to-date review of the NICE guidelines on hypertension, including the changes introduced in November 2023, always focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. Right, so let's jump into it. This guideline does not cover specific recommendations in CKD, type 1 diabetes or pregnancy. However, it does cover type 2 diabetes, given that the management of hypertension in type 2 diabetes is no different than in the general population. Let's just remind ourselves that when checking the blood pressure, we should always palpate the pulse first, and if there is pulse irregularity, we should measure the blood pressure manually, because automated devices are not accurate when the pulse is irregular, like in AF. If there are symptoms of postural hypertension, like falls or dizziness, we will measure their blood pressure when lying on their back, although we can consider a seated position if inconvenient. And we will measure their blood pressure again after standing for at least one minute. If the systolic blood pressure falls by 20 or more, or their diastolic blood pressure by 10 or more, we will consider the causes and review the medication. We will manage the risk of falls. We will check future blood pressure readings with the patient standing and we will refer if necessary. Also, in order to diagnose hypertension, we will measure the blood pressure in both arms. If the difference is more than 15, more than once, we will measure subsequent blood pressures in the arm with a higher reading. If the blood pressure measured in the clinic is 140 or 90 or higher, we will take a second measurement. If it is substantially different, we will take a third measurement and we will record the lowest of them as the clinic blood pressure. If the clinic blood pressure is between 140 over 90 and 180 over 120, we will confirm hypertension by doing ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or, if necessary, home blood pressure monitoring. While waiting, we will estimate the cardiovascular risk using the clinic blood pressure and we will carry out investigations for target organ damage by doing a urine test for hematuria dipstick and an albumin creatinine ratio or ACR, a blood test for HbA1c renal function tests, total cholesterol and HDL cholesterol, a 12-lead ECG and examination of the fundi for the presence of hypertensive retinopathy. If a person has a clinic blood pressure of 180 over 120 or higher, we will check for red flag symptoms or signs that would indicate the need for urgent same-day assessment in hospital. These are signs of retinal hemorrhage or papilledema, or life-threatening symptoms such as new onset confusion, chest pain, signs of heart failure or acute kidney injury, or signs of symptoms suggestive of pheochromocytoma, for example, labile or postural hypotension, headache, palpitations, pallor, abdominal pain, or diaphoresis or excessive sweating. If there are no symptoms or signs indicating same-day referral, we will carry out investigations for target organ damage as soon as possible. If target organ damage is identified, we will consider starting antihypertensive drug treatment immediately without waiting for the results of ambulatory or home blood pressure monitoring. If no target organ damage is identified, we will confirm the diagnosis of hypertension by either repeating the blood pressure within seven days or using ambulatory or home blood pressure monitoring, also reviewing the patient within seven days. When using home blood pressure monitoring, we will ensure that the blood pressure is checked twice, at least one minute apart, and the blood pressure is recorded twice daily, ideally in the morning and in the evening and the blood pressure is checked for at least four days, ideally for seven days. We will then disregard the blood pressure readings taken on the first day and use the average value of the rest to confirm the diagnosis. We will confirm the diagnosis of hypertension if the clinic blood pressure is 140 over 90 or higher and the ambulatory daytime average or home blood pressure monitoring average is 135 over 85 or higher. As a rule of thumb, the ambulatory or home readings are 5 mm of mercury lower than the clinic blood pressure. 
Obviously, if hypertension is not diagnosed, either it's target organ damage, we will investigate further. If hypertension is confirmed, we will offer lifestyle advice in respect to diet, exercise, smoking and alcohol, and we will encourage low caffeine and salt consumption. Salt substitutes containing potassium should not be used by older people, people with diabetes, pregnant women, people with kidney disease, and people taking ACE inhibitors and ARBs. When it comes to starting hypertensive medication, we will always use clinical judgment for people with frailty or multimorbidity. But in general, at any age, we will start antihypertensive treatment if the clinic blood pressure is 160 over 100 or higher, or the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or home blood pressure monitoring is 150 over 95 or higher. If the patient is over 80, we will consider antihypertensive treatment if the clinic blood pressure is over 150 over 90. If the patient is between 60 and 80, we will consider antihypertensives if the clinic blood pressure is 140 over 90 or higher, or ambulatory or home blood pressure monitoring is 135 over 85 or higher, but only if there is target organ damage, established cardiovascular disease, renal disease, diabetes or a cardiovascular risk of 10% or more. If the patient is under 60, we will consider antihypertensive medication if the clinic blood pressure is 140 over 90 or higher or ambulatory home blood pressure monitoring is 135 over 85 or higher regardless of the cardiovascular risk. And if the patient is under 40, we should consider referral for investigations of secondary courses. In terms of monitoring, we will check for postural hypertension if there are symptoms, for example, falls and dizziness, or if there is type 2 diabetes, or if the patient is aged 80 and over. And if there is postural hypertension or symptoms, we should base the blood pressure target on the standing blood pressure reading. In straightforward hypertension, without any other consideration, the blood pressure targets that we need to remember are if under 80, the target clinic blood pressure is below 140 over 90, or 135 over 85 if using ambulatory or home blood pressure monitoring. If aged 80 and over, the target clinic blood pressure is below 150 over 90, or 145 over 85 if using ambulatory or home blood pressure monitoring, always using clinical judgment if there is frailty or multimorbidity. These targets are for everyone, including type 2 diabetes, and not if the patient is pregnant or has CKD or type 1 diabetes. NICE has created two tables with blood pressure targets including patients with CKD and type 1 diabetes, so let's have a look at them. If a person is aged under 80, we have two targets, below 140 over 90 for general hypertension with or without type 2 diabetes, or type 1 diabetes with an ACR less than 70, or CKD with an ACR less than 70. And the second blood pressure target is below 130 over 80 in type 1 diabetes with an ACR of 70 or more or CKD with an ACR of 70 or more. If a person is 80 or over, we have three targets below 150 over 90 for people with hypertension with or without type 2 diabetes and also for those with type 1 diabetes regardless of ACR levels. Then below 140 over 90 in CKD with an ACR of less than 70 and the third target is below 130 over 80 in CKD with an ACR of 70 or more. I have streamlined these two tables into a single flowchart which you will be able to access in the episode description. Now to achieve these targets what antihypertensive medication should we choose? And again let's remember that if the patient has certain conditions we will not follow the hypertension guidelines, but the specific guideline for those conditions, such as the guideline on type 1 diabetes, CKD, cardiovascular disease like heart failure, stable angina and acute coronary syndromes, and pregnancy, and in particular we will note the MHOA advice to avoid ACE inhibitors and ARBs during pregnancy or breastfeeding or for women planning pregnancy. Otherwise, the following recommendations apply to everybody else, regardless of whether they have type 2 diabetes or not. Treating isolated systolic hypertension, that is, 
a systolic blood pressure of 160 or more, the same way as both raised systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Also, when treating patients of black African or African Caribbean family origin, we will go for an ARB in preference to an ACE inhibitor. This is because they have a low renin state and therefore ACE inhibitors and ARBs are less effective for them. However, when they're needed in this group of patients, ARBs are clinically more effective than ACE inhibitors. The treatment of hypertension comes in four steps. Step 1 treatment is with one drug, step 2 treatment with two drugs, step 3 treatment with three, and so on. So in step 1 treatment, that is when we initiate medication for the first time, we will offer an ACE inhibitor or an ARB if they have type 2 diabetes and are of any age or family origin, or they are aged under 55 but not of black African or African Caribbean family origin. Conversely, we will offer a calcium channel blocker if they're aged 55 or over and do not have type 2 diabetes, or are of black African or African Caribbean family origin and do not have type 2 diabetes regardless of their age. If a calcium channel blocker is not tolerated, for example because of edema, we will offer a thyroid-like diuretic. And we should offer a thyroid-like diuretic, such as indapamide, in preference to a conventional thyroid diuretic, such as pentaflumethyroside or hydrochlorothyroside. Step 2 treatment is treatment with two drugs, that is, if hypertension is not controlled with one drug, then if a patient is taking an ACE inhibitor or ARB, we will offer either a calcium channel blocker or a thyroid-like diuretic. On the other hand, if hypertension is not controlled with a calcium channel blocker, we will offer either an ACE inhibitor or ARB or a thyroid-like diuretic. Step 3 treatment is with three drugs, so if hypertension is not controlled, taking step 2 medication, we will offer a combination of them all, that is, an ACE inhibitor or ARB, a calcium channel blocker and a thyroid-like diuretic. But if hypertension is not controlled, taking these three drugs, we will regard them as having resistant hypertension. And before considering further treatment, we will discuss adherence. We will confirm it with an ambulatory blood pressure monitor or a home blood pressure monitor, and we will assess for postural hypertension. If resistant hypertension is confirmed, we may consider either seeking specialist advice or adding a fourth antihypertensive drug as step 4 treatment. So what is step 4 treatment with four drugs? Well, if we decide to give a fourth drug, we will need to look at the potassium level. And if the potassium level is 4.5 or less, we will give further diuretic therapy with low-dose spironolactone, with particular caution if the EGFR is very low because of the risk of hyperkalemia. When prescribing spironolactone, we will monitor electrolytes and EGFR within one month and repeat as needed thereafter. If the potassium level is more than 4.5, then we will give an alpha blocker or a beta blocker instead. If the blood pressure remains uncontrolled with four drugs, then we will need to seek specialist advice. And that is it, a quick summary of the NICE guideline on hypertension. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice, and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for listening and goodbye.